says that it, it's on this mountain, right? It's on Mount Zion, or you can think of it as Jerusalem, all right, that the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples this grand feast of choice meat and fine wine. All right, the context is that death uh, will be destroyed forever and that God will wipe away every tear and disgrace and the people uh, will rejoice and be glad in God's salvation. But you have to ask, who are these people? Right? Who, who are they that are actually included right, in this feast, invited to this feast? And we see in verse 9 uh, that it was for those who waited on the Lord. Right? On, if you read with me, on that day it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. So it is those who wait for him who are included in the blessings uh, and the feast. Now, if we long to be a part of all of this, uh, we certainly have to wait for him. And that's to say, to hope in him, to trust in him, to turn to him expectantly, to have a quiet confidence uh, in him. But what's gonna keep us waiting faithfully on the Lord through all the pain and suffering and persecution and trials, afflictions, temptations. All right, we, we get a clue uh, in the very verse that I just read, right? The people of God who have waited for him say, look, All right, this is our God, right? In other words, behold, this is our God. And indeed, this is what we will be doing in heaven. We will be beholding God in all of his glory, no longer seeing dimly as we do now. All right, but this is also the very thing that we must keep on doing today. All right, the act of looking on him, if we are to wait faithfully for him. And so the uh, main point today is to Look on the Lord God and wait on the Lord God. And so, uh, you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, I'm going to try and attempt to walk us through some of the glories revealed in this passage. And uh, I pray that God will help us uh, see his beauty and, and his glory. So, verse 6, right? On this mountain, uh, the Lord of armies. Right? And we're going to stop right there. Uh, you know, that's to say that God is not just the Lord of earthly armies, but also heavenly armies. And I'm going to try to give us some perspective uh, here on, the, on just the greatness of these heavenly armies. And basically what that says uh, about our God. And so, uh, famously, right, in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, we get this vision of God enthroned above and uh, these, these seraphim, right, these majestic, angelic creatures with six wings. Two wings, they cover their face. Uh, two wings, they fly. And two wings, they uh, cover their feet. And they call out to one another, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. And it says that the foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices. Did you get that? The foundations of the doorways of the very throne room of God shook just from the sheer voices of the seraphim. Can you... Imagine just how powerful of a being you, you need to be to actually shake, right, the very foundations of the doorways of God's throne room. You can certainly bet, right, if we were in the presence of such creatures, our bodies would tremble to its core from, its, from the rever- reverberating sound of their voices. Uh, I imagine that these creatures might be one of the most powerful, right, amongst the angelic beings as they are uh, situated 
in the very throne room, throne room of God. And in certain portions of scripture, you get glimpses of uh, you know, what angels can actually do. Um, and you actually do have one example here in the book of Isaiah when uh, King Hezekiah, uh, the king of Judah, uh, was threatened by the king of Assyria. And the uh, king of Assyria arrogantly challenges the Lord of armies. What does God do? Right, he, he sends one angel, right? Not, not an army of angels. He sends one angel, and that angel completely obliterates the army of the king of Assyria. And over the course of one night, Judah wakes up to 185,000 dead bodies. And, you know, just to give you some perspective, Reggie, you know, that's over three Dodger Stadium's maxed out capacity worth of dead bodies from one angel, right? And if you think that's crazy and you think that's, man, that's incredibly powerful, I just want you to know that that's elementary for angels. Right, I'll just mention one from Revelation. One angel strikes a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. It's incredible, right? It's, it's really hard to imagine just how much energy you, you need to, to knock out a third of the stars of the universe. And so, you know, this gives you an idea of just how incredibly powerful uh, these creatures are. Right? Not to mention in Revelation 5.11, it talks about how there are myriads and myriads of angels. Right? That's to say ten thousands of ten thousands, thousands upon thousands. Right? The idea here is that there is a countless sea of these angels under the authority of the Lord of armies. And though their powers are unfathomable to an extent to the human mind and Though there are countless numbers of them, and yet these fearsome, glorious, angelic creatures called seraphim, who seem to be closest to God's presence in His presence in His throne room, would cover its face with its two wings and dare, dare not look at the Lord of Armies, who would dare not show its lowly parts of its body, namely its feet. That too, they would cover with its wings. You know, what does it say about God and his power? All right, this speaks to the unapproachable, inexhaustible, incalculable majesty, power, and the glory of God. All right, there is an infinite chasm uh, between the two. In Revelation 22.9, you'll see the attitude of one angel. We heard from Ben um, earlier this morning. This one angel who tells John not to worship him. Right? He says that he too is a servant of God. All of us, right? all of creation, we're, we're just lumped up into one, one category. It doesn't matter how powerful and how ridiculously, incredibly powerful these angels are. Uh, before God, we just all get lumped up into one category, and God is in a completely different category of worth, infinitely displaced above us. All right, these heavenly, these heavenly armies of angels, God can raise up or destroy on a whim. Right, if he can do this with heavenly armies, he can certainly do this with earthly armies. And this title, the Lord of Armies is used around 60 times. Uh, just might be the most used title in the book of Isaiah. And I think the second title, unsurprisingly, is, is the Holy One of Israel. But this title, the Lord of Armies, it is as though God is saying through the prophet Isaiah to the nation of Judah, why are you placing your trust in the armies of other nations for security, for your salvation? When I am the Lord of armies, or that's what the nation of Judah was doing during the time of Isaiah. So now to circle you know, that around to us in this day and age, yeah, BBC, we're, uh, yeah, we're no different, right? 
We're no different than the nation of Judah. We do the same thing. It uh, just you know, looks a little different. Uh, whenever we're pressured by some circum circumstance, uh, what do we do, right? Our instinct is to primarily lean on ourselves or lean on another person or, or a group uh, of friends or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know what that is, right? We lean on these things thinking that it will deliver us. And really at the end of it, it leaves us with no peace and uh, just a more hardened heart. And so the title of the Lord of Armies shows us that he is unmatched in power and that he is mighty to save. What army or what power can threaten the Lord? All his enemies, Satan and his forces, will be destroyed on the day of vengeance. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 26, uh, and, you know, starting from verse 7, uh, the last enemy that God will destroy is death. So, brothers and sisters, wait on the Lord. Turn to him expectantly in your struggles. Don't be like Judah. Let's continue. Uh, on this mountain, the Lord of armies will uh, prepare. And let's stop there. Uh, you know, if you read the charges of sin that the Lord has against Judah, is Israel, the surrounding nations, and the whole world, you know, many of which can be applied to us today, I, you know, I have a whole bunch of, uh, of them written down in my notes. I, I wish I could read them to you. Uh, but you have to wonder how this Lord of armies, whom glorious angels dare not to look upon, would then take on a role of servanthood and prepare a feast for dead dogs like you and me. Right? Does a king serve a beggar? Right? Does a king serve the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame, the filthy, the vile? And yet, we know that there is indeed a king prophesied in this very book of Isaiah, who would become the suffering servant for his people. This very servant who was God himself would become man and dwell among us. He would be despised and rejected. He knew what sin sickness was. Uh, he was like one who people turned away from. He was despised. He would not be valued. Right? Jesus Christ who is worth more than all the these angelic creatures mentioned earlier and earthly creatures combined, whose total sum with all of creation wouldn't even begin to compare to the worth of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. This Son of God would not be valued by you and me. Now, do you realize, brothers and sisters, what we have done? Do you realize, O oh sinner, what you have done? We have profaned the very worth of God. We took the very worth of the Holy One of Israel and treated him to be in the same league as criminals and thieves and murderers and the wicked. These things should not be. And oh, how we deserve the wrath of God, ten thousands of ten thousand times over to the utmost degree. Yet Jesus Christ, right, in the words of Isaiah, he himself bore sickness. He carried our pains. He was pierced because of our rebellion crushed under the very wrath of God because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds, right? We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Brothers and sisters, wait on him. You can trust him. To the unbelieving, repent. 
Turn from your sin and trust in Christ for your salvation, for he will abundantly pardon. For God's thoughts are not like your thoughts, O sinner, and your ways aren't like God's. His thoughts are, and his ways are higher, are much higher. Where can you find such a love? Do you see it? Let's continue. The Lord of armies, on this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine. Luke 22 I'm going to read two, two passages, and I think you'll, you'll see where uh, my point is headed. Luke 22, 15 to 18. Then, he said, then Christ said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. All right, Exodus 12, 8. All right, during the Passover, God says, they are to eat the meat that night. All right, they should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and uh, bitter herbs. All right, notice, what are the people of God eating in the feast that's to come? All right, they're eating meat and they're drinking wine, right? Now, I'm going to argue that it's the Passover meal that Jesus was looking forward to eating with his disciples, uh, mentioned in Luke 22, 15, 18, 15 to 18. And if you don't believe me and think it's a stretch, uh, let's just look down at verse 7 and uh, verse 8, right? It so happens that God... Uh, destroys death, right? And so God has, in some final sense, passed over his people and swallowed up death uh, forever. And from that point on, his people are brought into an eternal rest and an eternal joy. And there you can be sure we will no longer uh, hunger, we will no longer thirst For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd us, and he will guide us to the springs of the waters of life. Revelation 7, 16 through 17. Though this is uh, what it will be like in heaven, Isaiah would argue that in some sense that feast can be experienced now. Isaiah 55, 1 to 2. Come, everyone who is thirsty... I come to the water, and you without silver, come buy and eat. I come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food, right? And your wages on what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choices of foods. So brothers and sisters, Turn to him who will abundantly satisfy. And lastly, uh, I want to leave us uh, with this one. Uh, one of the re- reoccurring themes of in Isaiah is the holiness of God. I mentioned that the second most used title that I've seen in my reading is the Holy One of Israel. Holy meaning not that he's just sinless, but that he is of a totally different quality in every sense possible. I hope you can see that the title of the Lord of Armies can really only belong to one, and it's him. He's, He's never known defeat. He always accomplishes what he pleases, nothing no, no army, no power can throw thwart with his plans. And on the second point, on this humbling, right, this emptying of Jesus Christ, who is God to take on the form of a mere creature, 
right? It will take an eternity of eternities to fathom the greatness of such humbling. And even after those eternities, we will still be at the beginning of understanding such greatness. It's not as simple as comparing Joe, uh, me to, uh, you know, taking on the form of an ant, right? There's a finite difference between the two. But God and human, all right, there's an infinite chasm of difference, a, a gap that can't be realized. And on the third point, right, God is set apart in his ability to satisfy. Right, all creatures, everything that is created has a glory that is exhaustible. And that's why we always move on to the next new thing because what was once satisfying to us is no longer, right? What was once glorious to us is no longer. All right, but God, he's inexhaustible in his glory and in his beauty. All right, this is why, as Isaiah would say, everlasting joy will be on our heads, right? eternity of eternities and we'll still only be at the tip of the iceberg that is the glory of God. And, uh, I want to end with a verse that I think captures the heart of the book of Isaiah and as well as the heart of this passage. Uh, Isaiah 45, 21, there is no other God but me a righteous God and Savior. There is no one except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, there is no other God but you. I pray, Lord, that for all of us here and in the days to come, that you will give us glimpses of your glory. Allow us to behold you, that we might wait on you faithfully till we uh, eat uh, and, uh, the Passover meal. Uh, with you on that day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>